to share with you something that I haven't felt comfortable sharing with you in the past two years as being lead pastor. In fact, it's just about a week ago, I felt the courage enough to share this with the staff. I thought it was probably time that you know this about me. When I was 16 years old, I failed my driver's test. Maybe it's a confession to make to you today. And before you like judge me, let me just provide some context. First of all, at that point in history, when I was 16, the great state of Kentucky did not require any driver education program before you took your permit test or your driver's test. And so my high school didn't even offer driver's ed. And so the practice I got preparing to drive was about being 14 years old, stealing my dad's car keys while he was shaking hands at the back door at the church where he pastored. And I spent hours driving around the church parking lot while my mom and dad chatted with their friends for literally hours. Lots of time to practice, right? Other than picking up that driver's manual at the county courthouse, I really didn't have any other, you know, uh, investment into my driving. And so I sat to take the permit test. I passed it. And then as a permitted driver, bugged around town a little bit. And I thought, okay, time has passed. It's time for me to take the driving exam. So I showed up at the county courthouse. The examiner stepped into my car and we started going around my hometown, Maysville, Kentucky. And I made complete stops every time. I even had that little rock back motion. You know what I'm talking about? You parents who've trained your kids to you know, stop, make it rock back. Yeah. I nailed the parallel parking test. I mean, nailed it, didn't even miss a thing. We made it all the way back around to the courthouse to where I heard those fateful words. The examiner said, Mr. Heller, I'm sorry, you failed the test. I was shocked, I was embarrassed, I was demoralized, I about started crying, I tried to fight back the tears, right? And then he explained to me, you made 18 stops throughout our exam here today and everyone was a complete stop, however, the front of your vehicle was in the crosswalk every time you stopped. And I had to deduct you points every time you made that mistake. And so you've missed so many points, you have gone below a passing grade. I'm sorry, you'll have to wait seven days and come back and take it again. And I made that walk of shame to my parents' car, you know, got in and seven days later, I showed back up, same courthouse, exact same examiner, he hopped in the car and we made one quick trip around one block of my hometown that time. He headed back to the courthouse and he said, you've got this, you've learned your lessons, congratulations. I was elated, right? I wish the story stopped there. But in 2006, I was living in Louisville, Kentucky and I moved to Noblesville, Indiana. I was not aware that the state of Kentucky and state of Indiana do not have reciprocal relationship when it comes to a motor operator vehicles license. And so I showed up to exchange my Kentucky license for an Indiana license. And the lady behind the counter said, do you want to take the test? I was like, no, I've, I've got a valid driver's license. And she said, well, to get an Indiana license, you have to pass the test. I was like, can I do it now? I'm feeling real confident. And she said, sure. So I sat down to take the test right before I did. I made the mistake of calling my wife and saying, honey, we actually have to take a test to get an Indiana license. Do you want to do that? She said, I'll be right over. Well, before she got there, I started working my way through the test. I saw her come in out of the corner of my eye. She started her test. I took my completed exam up to the counter. The lady graded real quick, looked up at me and said, I'm sorry, you've failed the test. I said, you've got to be joking. And she said, this is no joking matter. I was like, listen, Missy, you're like 20 years old. I just want to, you know, I tried not to embarrass myself, my savior, my family, any of that, right? Okay. So I made the walk of shame this time out to my car. I thought I'd stick around and maybe comfort my wife if she had had the same experience, right? Mistake number two, she came out bearing her Indiana driver's license, right? <laughs> Passed it the first time. So I went home with a little driver's manual from the state of Indiana. I crammed for a week, went back. And I want you to know I am a licensed driver here in the state of Indiana. Have been since 2006, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's shameful, shameful, you know? Here's what I realized for way too long in the church. We have talked about following Jesus, but we've kind of let people figure it out for themselves. We talk a lot about the difference that Jesus makes in our life. And some people seem to have this really close, intimate, life-giving, fruit-bearing relationship with God. And maybe the rest of us feel like we don't, or it seems like quite a bit of struggle to experience what they have. Well, today and over the next four weeks, like never before in the life of this congregation, we want to help every person who calls Crossroads home, or for that matter, any person who's interested in following Jesus, 
know exactly how to do that. We want every person in this congregation, anybody that we would have influence on, to be able to experience a relationship with God that is intimate and deep and loving, that is life-giving and fruit-bearing. And God wants to have that type of relationship with us. You see, from the very beginning of creation, God designed and desired to have a relationship with us. When he made Adam and Eve and placed them in the beautiful garden, he wanted them to enjoy all that he had made, but he also wanted to enjoy them. He wanted to have a relationship with them, and he did. Genesis 2 and 3 talk about God coming down and walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And we assume that it was with Adam and Eve because one time he went looking for them and he couldn't find them. They were hiding. Why? Because they had sinned. They had disobeyed God, which is basically the definition of sin. They had chosen a different path than what God had offered them. And because of that, the relationship between God and mankind was severed. And it had to be reconciled. The rest of scripture is one story of the reconciliation mission that God has been on to restore the relationship that we can have with him. When Jesus came to our planet, he came on mission. And Jesus' mission was to restore the relationship between us and God. We believe all that scripture teaches about Jesus, that he is fully God and he's also fully man, that he is perfect in every way. And because of this, he is capable to restore the relationship back between us and God by taking the punishment of our sin and dying on the cross in our place and then resurrecting from the grave. And because those things are true about Jesus, he can mediate this relationship and restore our relationship back with God. It allows us to live in victory here on earth and also to have confidence in a restored fellowship with God, our Heavenly Father. We are now friends with God and his children. We're co-heirs with Christ because of all that Jesus has done for us and is doing in us. This restored relationship comes with privileges, but it also comes with responsibilities. The mission that God gave Jesus as the son involves us because we are his children as well. We've been invited into God's mission. We've been adopted as his children into his family, and we're commissioned to carry out the exact same mission that Jesus had here on earth. We help people experience a relationship with God, being reconciled through Jesus, a a relationship that is deep and intimate and loving. It's life-giving and fruit-bearing. Listen to how Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says these words, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I think mission is rooted in the identity of God himself. God is on mission, and Jesus embodied that mission when he came here to earth. Scripture teaches us and challenges us as Christ followers to join the mission as well. After arriving back at Crossroads in the summer of 2019, the elders and I fasted and prayed, asking God this question, God, would you bring clarity and unity around the the vision and mission and strategy that you have for us as a congregation. And in September of 2019, the leadership team at the time, as well as our elders, we retreated together asking God this question, show us what it looks like to take the next steps in living out where you want us to go as a congregation. It's one of those moments in the past two years that I've seen God show up in a very deliberate way. As we prayed and considered God's mission and the opportunity we had to join him in his mission, our hearts began to really... um, just resonate with the challenge of what it truly looks like. Something began to bubble up, and we came to this conclusion, joining God in his mission is best accomplished by truly emulating Jesus. John wrote in 1 John 2, verse 6, these words, whoever claims to live in God must live as Jesus did. The Amplified translation of the Bible says this, whoever says he lives in Christ 
That is, whoever says he's accepted Jesus as God and Savior ought, as a moral obligation, to walk and conduct himself just as Jesus walked and conducted himself. A lot of words to say the exact same thing. The goal in life is to live and love like Jesus. When we choose to follow Jesus by accepting him as Savior and surrendering to him as Lord, we make a deliberate decision to live like him and to love like him. We began thinking about those becoming our marching orders as the way we join him in this mission. And as we considered, continued to consider what our next steps may be, we kept circling back to this thought. What if every person who called Crossroads home would live in love like Jesus did? Living and loving like Jesus embodies God's mission for his church collectively, but also for us individually. If we truly have a passion to be part of God's mission, we have to get our heads around how each of us live this out as individuals, as well as collectively as a congregation. We've looked at the way that Jesus lived and the way that he loves, and we've discovered that following Jesus revolves around three things, being with God, being with others, and being sent. When you walk through the four accounts of Jesus' life, they're the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is obvious how Jesus lived and how he loved, what was essential to him, what how he spent his time, how he expressed his faith and trust in God, as well as how he interacted with others, how he served. Jesus had a deep, intimate, life-giving, fruit-bearing relationship with God. He had a a strong understanding of God's word. He had a, a clear understanding of who God is. He developed spiritual practices. He listened to the Holy Spirit's voice. Jesus spent time with others, worshiping, praying, learning, serving, having influence on the world around him. And Jesus knew why he was sent. He knew what the mission was. He understood how his gifts contributed to the mission. He was engaged in the world around him. He also offered justice and compassion to anybody that he met. If that's how Jesus lived and loved, then that's how his followers must live and love also. I want you to know it's really not about doing a bunch of things. It's about being, being with God, being with others, and being sent. Before I share with you this morning a a way that we want to help equip every person for this living and loving like Jesus journey, I thought it might be important for you to to see a real-life example of somebody who's trying to live and love this way. And before he comes, I'll just put out this disclaimer. He'd be the first to tell you he's not perfect at doing this. But over the past two years, having made a decision to follow Jesus, he's trying to translate in that into his life in every aspect of his life. And I asked if he would let me ask him a few questions today, and he said yes. And so I would ask you to welcome with me to the stage, Patrick Hickey. Patrick, thanks for spending some time with us today. I appreciate your willingness to do that. I'm just going to just jump right in. I want to know what led you to make a decision to follow Jesus. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in church, but not in Christ. So I've used that line a lot, but, um, you know, it's taken from a a book, uh, Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. It's just all about, like, what being a devoted follower of Christ looks like. And, you know, for the longest time, you know, I thought I was a Christian. You know, I would have marked Christian on whatever you know, box or whatever. But um, yeah, I definitely was not, though. Um, like, I, I grew up in church, you know, went Sundays, Wednesdays, baptized as a, as a teenager, but uh, just didn't have that um, life kind of transformation because there was no relationship with Jesus. There was no point of surrender, no, yeah, so... Went to college and uh, pretty young and impressionable, like a lot of people, you know, didn't have any kind of foundation in, like on me, so like I started to live for myself. I did what, you know, a lot of, a lot of times what you hear, like create yourself, build your brand, you know, do whatever feels good, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I tried to uh, create a life of happiness. You know, we're, we're all on, you know, everybody wants to be happy. So, you know, did that throughout my 20s and kind of just hit this breaking point. Like anybody that knows me, 
or knew me, you know, before, you know, before Christ knew that at that time I was extremely broken and um, like this life that I tried to build kind of just came crumbling down. Uh, things weren't happening and on, uh, according to my plans and my timing, that, like, so I was trying to build my own kingdom and it failed. I considered myself a failure. I hated myself. And so, like, kind of just going back to the, to the, um, yeah, like, I had nowhere else left to turn but to God. So I was like, okay, God, like, it's your turn. And, um, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I tried. Like, I tried my very, like, best just to seek after the Lord. And, um, yeah, I, going back to that Not a Fan book, I um, was in tears. It's like the last few chapters as it talked about uh, following Jesus means following him wherever, uh, wherever, whenever, and doing whatever. And I knew I wanted that. And um, the last, last sentence of the book was, now go live it out. And I remember stumbling into my bedroom from my living room just a few feet away in my apartment and just collapsing, like just on my hands and knees, like begging for forgiveness, surrendering, um, you know, believing in Christ, turning to Christ. And um, it, was, it was just really cool, like that kind of moment, like that was, that was like God smacking the gavel down and saying, like, not guilty. Um, and it's just, it's been cool, it was cool after that just to see, you know, uh, that, like, what happened to me is also is how it exactly goes in the Bible, too, so. Wow. It's a powerful moment. I know pretty soon after that, we started talking a lot here at Crossroads about living and loving like Jesus, and I'd love to hear from you, like, how did that resonate with you? What kind of transformation did that kind of challenge bring to you? I had kind of a quiet rebellion when I was in my, you know, early 20s. I was very much a, uh, you know, stick it to the man, like, don't tell me what to do kind of guy. Um, and my dad, like, uh, tried to use that. He would say, like, okay, well, sell out to God. Like, you don't want to sell it to man, sell it to God. And, then, like, that should have resonated, but it just did not for whatever reason. I went back to my old kind of selfish ways. And, uh, but I think that describes it like, I think that describes living and loving like Jesus pretty well, in my opinion. Like, uh, either you're all in or you're not. And so just selling out to God and, um, you know, I don't, I don't do that perfectly. Like, um, uh, that's, like, kind of unattainable. But I try my best. I'm, I'm sold out in my desire and pursuit to be like Jesus. And um, so since I've, like, come, become born again, uh, just being more mindful and intentional about how I kind of steward my resources or energy. So, like, from a time, energy, and money kind of standpoint, like, living and loving like Jesus to me has been, you know, um, you know, an everyday kind of conversation. There's gossip, there's, there's whatever, there's, there's kind of toxic, unhealthy relationships. So not really, you know, just not engaging in that with friends, coworkers, whoever, and just basically turning small, you know, small talk into meaningful conversation. Like, how can I encourage this person? How can I help them find purpose or meaning or contentment in where they are? And so, and then from an energy standpoint, you know, just saying no to more things. Uh, Like, we all know, like, what kind of kinds of things we should be saying no to, like, to. And it's a challenge for me because I, like, you know, said yes to a lot of things in my 20s, and that really helped, you know, when, I, when it came to saying yes to Jesus. But, like, it can also be saying no to, like, some things that may be, like, good and fine, but just aren't life-giving to you. And maybe, you know, you need to stop doing and doing and just be, like, be, like, be with God. Uh, so just resting. And then um, uh, from a money standpoint, like, I'm a, I'm a spender more than a saver. And so, like, it's been really cool just to rethink money, like, rethink uh, the money that, that God has given me. Like, how can I... Um, you know, how can I give it to somebody in need, or how can I uh, bless somebody with a gift, a surprise, um, or like just uh, tithing, supporting missionaries and nonprofits uh, financially. So those kinds of things, has, it's, it's just way more fulfilling to contribute than consume. So that's been really cool. I love how you just pointed out that it's these simple daily type of things that you're thinking through and filtering through this desire to live in love like Jesus, not, oh, yeah, I saved the world from hunger. You know, I mean, it's like, 
how I'm spending my energy, my time, my, my money. Thanks for those examples. Um, I guess I want to know, like, what's helped you in this journey? What has been supportive or encouraging, challenging um, to help you kind of make progress in this journey? Yeah, really just what God is doing through the people, like, around us here, like, plugging into a faith community at Crossroads um, uh, and just seeing, yeah, seeing the examples that other people set. Like, I know uh, a lot of people are... Um, are also in this pursuit. They're also sold out to live in love like Jesus. And so, like, when I see Phil or when I see whoever um, and I'm looking up to their example, I'm not trying to be Phil. I'm trying to be what Jesus is doing in Phil or what Jesus is doing in somebody else. So, um, so yeah, just engaging in the life and ministries of, of Crossroads and um, just inspires me to follow Jesus. Um, like, in my first month or two of seeking um, and, and following Jesus, there were so many people that, uh, like, I got to meet, like, just in the atrium here or um, wherever it was, uh, down at Pottersville or um, just, yeah. So, um, so many people, like my buddy Cole, uh, super, super busy, uh, hectic time of his life that he took out to share Jesus with me. Um, Guys like Angelo and, and Jeff, uh, I love their kind of heart posture towards God as, as you know, just men in Christ and, and how they use their, their, um, their skills and their giftings for God's kingdom. Uh, people like Stephen Weinzapple, like showing me what community actually looks like. I had no idea what community was, moving around so much, no idea. Like he showed me acceptance and community and belonging. That was huge. And like I've got a list of like... <laughs> eight people on here that I could just go on and on. Um, but, like, my point is, like, that was all within my first two months, and, like, the things that, like, I was able to learn from them, um, yeah, just really uh, helped me grow. And so that would be my best advice to, like, anybody looking to take a next step is, um, you know, just don't do this alone. Like, connect with people. There's so many people here that, that want to connect and point you to God, point you to, like, yeah, whatever whatever it is that you're, that you're seeking, so, including me. So, like, if, uh, if you want to uh, get coffee sometime or, you know, whatever, like, come see me, you know, after service. Love that. I know uh, you've gotten a sneak peek at something that I'm getting ready to share with the whole congregation called the Roadmap. We've put it together to help people discover how to live in love like Jesus, what it looks like, and how to take steps that direction. Because you've seen it before them, I just would love to hear from you. How do you think, how do you anticipate it being helpful in this journey? Yeah, so I kind of just think of it as an evergreen and evolving pathway to growth. So like the basic idea is that wherever you are on your journey, like there are next steps. Um, and it's not like a checklist that we're check, 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 all like being with God done, being with others or, and being sent, like, done, like, I live in love like Jesus perfectly now. It's always going to be evolving. There's going to be fresh content. Um, and, like, I don't know. I just, it encourages, encourages us to go deeper. So um, you may be, um, you know, kind of in a rut. You may hit, a, like, a dead end. I don't know what to do next. So, like, go back to the Holy Spirit and listen. Or go back to that friend and, and ask for advice. Like, so, yeah, just really cool. And I love the the posture that it intends and hopes to um, foster within us. So just in that kind of like moving forward um, kind of way, um, you know, you may be in a place one day or a week where um, you need to go back to the source and see how Jesus, you know, lived. What, where did he spend his time doing? What kind of places? Um, you know, he ate a lot. So I think food's a Probably a big, <laughs> big thing to, to do with living, loving like Jesus. But okay, so run with that. Be, you make it goal to be more intentional in, in how hospitable you are. So you have friends or neighbors or family or, or coworkers over to your house and you have good dinner and good conversation. Um, and maybe that leads you to being more intentional, going a step further and, and going into a neighborhood that, that you would never go to or um, hanging out with people that don't look like you. Uh, so, like, yeah, I just, it's, it's stepping into this whole journey and being who God created you to be. Um, so, yeah, I just, I love, love that, that, that part about it. And, um, 
like kind of just going back to the beginning, like building, um, it's all for building, you know, God's kingdom and not, not yours. So, um, you know, in, in building God's kingdom, that, that leads to fulfillment. That leads to joy and purpose and everything that we're looking for, happiness, freedom. Uh, it's all found in building, building God's kingdom and, and not our own. Well, man, I appreciate your uh, authenticity. Just thanks for just being authentic. Thanks for also your humility. That means a lot to me. Uh, I thank you for your intentionality, how you're trying to deliberately follow Jesus in your life. And also thank you for your availability. Uh, on the front row is Patrick's fiance. They are getting married this Saturday. So on the week before his wedding, he said yes to being up here today. So thank him for his time. I appreciate you, man. And uh, good luck. God bless your marriage too. Excited for you and Amy. Well, I hope by now you know my heart as your pastor, and I hope that you're beginning to understand who we are as a church and what's really important to us, and that is that we wanna help every person who calls Crossroads home learn how to live and to love like Jesus. And we really believe that the roadmap that I'm getting ready to share with you will help in doing that. We think doing that is actually what Jesus wanted us to do when he gave us the Great Commission. And he said in Matthew 28, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. That's God's mission. And I think to do that, we needed to create a spiritual growth pathway that would help us have a chance at getting close to that instead of just figuring it out for ourselves on our own. And so the roadmap helps clarify how to live and to love like Jesus, what it means to be with God, to be with others, and to be sent. The roadmap equips every person for this journey through clear action steps and helpful resources. The roadmap is designed to help anyone who wants to follow Jesus know how to do just that. And the roadmap's designed with actionable steps that you can take in growing and living and loving like Jesus to experience this deep, intimate, life-giving, fruit-bearing relationship that God wants all of us to have. The Bible is very clear. We are saved by grace through faith in what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross for our place. But it also is very clear that the work of the Holy Spirit is to there help us become like Jesus. That work is accomplished for us and in us, but we play a role in it as well. John says in 1 John 3, in the message translation, what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God. That's exactly who we are, children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him. And in seeing him become like him, all of us who look forward to his coming, stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. We model our lives after Jesus. We live and we love like him. And when we do, people come to faith and their lives are renewed, recreated, transformed. They experience reconciliation with God. When you and I live in love like Jesus, our faith comes alive in our hearts because we begin to experience God's power working in us and through us as we fully depend on him. When you and I live in love like Jesus, marriages are strengthened, families are healthy and whole because we're surrendered to God and also to each other. When you and I live in love like Jesus, our workplaces are filled with people who work hard, but they love deep as well who serve not because they're just getting paid, but because they are called to something more. When you and I live in love like Jesus, our neighborhoods are welcoming and mutually beneficial because people aren't just looking out for their own needs, but they're also looking out for the needs and well-being of others. When you and I live in love like Jesus, the needs of the vulnerable and hopeless in our community and our world, they're noticed and they're met. When you and I live in love like Jesus, we welcome orphans into safe homes. The homeless, the hungry, the helpless are served and strengthened. And when you and I live in love like Jesus, every person that we lock eyes with feels valued because we look at them like Jesus does. We want to help every person 
to live in love like Jesus. So right now, what I want you to do is pull out your mobile device. It can be a phone, it can be a, an iPad or a tablet. I want you to grab your phone and I want you to open it to your camera. And I'm gonna ask you to aim your camera at that QR code. If that's a little too techy for you, all you have to do is get your internet browser, Safari, click on that and you can type in the words cccgo.com forward slash roadmap. In fact, uh, you received a card when you came in. That has the same QR code, same address on there. I'd love for everybody to go to this website. It's the roadmap. And when you get there, about halfway down this home page is going to be a big button that says subscribe. And I'd love for you to click on that subscribe button. It's going to ask you four simple questions. I passed my driver's exam twice. You can pass this exam. It's your first name, your last name, your email address, your phone number. If you'll enter that information, that's going to subscribe you to the roadmap. And the reason you want to be subscribed is beginning this week, we're going to start sharing with you messages and content that have to populate the roadmap. And it'll allow you to stay up to date with resources and action steps that we can all take to live in love like Jesus. It'll also help you get connected to other people who are journeying this path with us. Go ahead and subscribe. Over the next three weeks, we're going to focus in on these three expressions of living and loving like Jesus, being with God, being with others, and being sent. Now, when you go to the roadmap today, you're going to think, wow, this is a lot of talk for just a little bit. Well, Please understand, we're going to populate this over the next three weeks. We did this deliberately, this very small trickle rollout, so that you could get your arms around what it truly means to live in love like Jesus and not be overwhelmed and rush on this afternoon and start doing all these things because you think you have to or you should. That's not what the roadmap's all about. It's a roadmap. It provides direction. So here's a couple things in closing I want you to know about the roadmap. And the first is this, it's for everyone. We feel anyone over the age of 12 years old can engage in the roadmap and experience movement in their relationship with God to live in love like Jesus. Now, if you have somebody in your house under the age of 12, please know that our kids ministry is currently developing age-appropriate programming resources that follow the same path. We're all on the same journey together. The roadmap is for everyone. A couple of weeks ago, I got to volunteer for Camp Alive, and they sent me to the preschool to volunteer. I think they finally found a wavelength that I could relate to, right? And so I got to teach on Thursday in the preschool Camp Alive, and I taught preschoolers how to be with God. If they can learn it, we can all learn it, okay? And so I want to encourage you that the roadmap's for everyone. Second of all, it is not a solo sport. I appreciate what Patrick had to say, that this is something to be journeyed with together, it is for everybody, but it's not to be uh, journeyed alone. We want you to share the roadmap by talking about the action steps and resources with your spouse or with your children or in your small group or with friends or sharing it with others. It is not to be done alone. The roadmap is also not a to-do list. We deliberately are sharing these action steps, not so you'll go out and accomplish them all in one sitting. That's not its design. It's to keep you focused and centered and moving forward in your relationship with God. These are action steps you might circle back to many a times. Just like you take a familiar path to work. You know where it's headed and you want to go there. So you're walking this path with us. Also, it's a journey. Following Jesus is not a one-time decision. It is a daily decision that you live for the rest of your life. And we want to equip you to experience a deep, intimate, life-giving, fruit-bearing relationship with God that will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. It's for you whether you've been following Jesus for five minutes or for 50 years. And finally, this roadmap, it all starts by deciding to follow Jesus. The beginning of this journey is accepting by faith that Jesus is who the Bible says he is, that he died on a cross as a savior to provide for you a way to be reconciled with God. And he resurrected from the grave to show that he is Lord over sin and death, heaven and earth. And by accepting him as your savior and surrendering to him as your Lord, you'll begin to experience life to the fullest is what he came to bring us. And you'll be so motivated by that that you'll want to live and love like him. 
The destination of this roadmap is living and loving like Jesus. And we want the roadmap to help you on this journey by being with God, being with others, and being sent. If you're here today and you'd like to know more about who Jesus is and how to follow him and make a decision to follow him, the roadmap can help you with that. And if you want to know more how to live in love like Jesus and to experience this deep, intimate, life-giving, fruit-bearing relationship with him, well, the roadmap will help you with that too by being with God, being others, being sent. My prayer today is that you would join us on this journey. Watch your life change to be more like Jesus. And also to watch the lives around you change because you're being salt and light in the world that God has placed you, whether that's your family, your neighborhood, your workplace, your friendships, maybe just people you meet along the way. God wants to do something incredible in and through you. We hope the roadmap will help guide you in that journey. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you that you wanted a relationship with us so much you created us knowing that we would sin and and just blow it all to shreds. And yet, because of that, you pursued us even more by giving up your only son so that we could be your sons and daughters. God, because of that, because of that love and grace that we've received for you, we want to live a life that honors you. We want to have a relationship with you. And God, I'm so glad you didn't just throw us out there and make us figure it out by ourselves, but you gave us your word gave us your Holy Spirit. You gave us Jesus as an example to follow. And God, I pray that you have been a part of every moment of making this roadmap a reality so that all of us could have that deep, intimate, life-giving, fruit-bearing relationship you've created us all for. And God, I pray that our lives would change to be more like Jesus. And God, I pray that the world around us would recognize and be influenced because of that. Not for our glory, God, but for yours. And I pray that through the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.